today we are dealing with the matter of forgiveness. And I just, based on the scenario that we heard today, I want to ask the question, do you think that she should forgive him? Yes. Let me see the hands of all those who say yes. And let me see all the hands of all those who say no. But you got to be honest, you're in church. Okay, at least, Iman, he says no. Imani says no. But let me ask you the question, how many of you in that situation would have forgiven him? No, I saw a whole lot of hands up when you said yes. So I want to see the hands of those who would, if they were in the exact same situation, would have forgiven him. All right, let's settle along, let's settle along, let's settle down. We are the same place that we always find ourselves when we come to these things. We all know that we should forgive. But very few of us are willing to forgive. The question therefore comes to you now. What is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? And if you, feel, if you have a definition for forgiveness that you coined, you could come up to the mic and you could say what you think your definition of forgiveness is. Anybody, what do you think forgiveness is? Um, I think forgiveness is letting go of everything. All right. Letting it in God's hand. Yeah, yes, I. Letting go everything. Anybody else? Yes, come to the mic. Remember, once I ask a question, you have an answer, you want to make a comment, feel free to come to the mic. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Yes, please. Uh, for me, forgiveness is not forgetting, number one. Uh-huh. And number two, forgive. Real woman. He's a real woman. <laughs> it's not forgetting. <laughs> the Lord said forgive. He never said forget. Okay. <laughs> and the second thing, I think forgiveness is allowing your mind towards that person to return to the state it was before they committed the act. So how you think about that person, how you react to that person, returns to how, well, more or less, to how it was before. But forgetting means that you're still with a little bit of caution. A little bit of what? Caution? <laughs> okay, that's our final comment on definition of forgiveness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is that if we understand what the Bible teaches us, it is not what we want to do, you know. Because everything we do in life is for Christ, you know. And if we don't understand anything, then it is we are point of a situation where we like, should I do this, should I do that? Christ forgives because he sees what would have done to him. We supposed to learn and follow by his instruction. And I'm sure that every someone even do you something, and you look at the whole situation that Jesus Christ would have done, it means that you should do the same. For me, I went through situations where people that I even had to tell myself, like, you know what, forget it, leave it there. Oh, so what, what is forgiveness? What is your definition of forgiveness? My opinion for forgiveness is that Jesus Christ would have taught us by lot to forgive and forget everything that you or that person would have done to you. Okay. And one thing we to learn, it is not only to forgive. We just want your definition. You don't have to. My definition, have my definition is, is that if... Someone do me something and I recognize well, like, okay, it is a situation where I can tell like, you know what, I forgive you. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. Keep on, what's yours? To me, forgiveness is forgetting the things behind and looking forward to the future. And depends on how bad the situation is, letting God through the Holy Spirit guide you in overcoming the rough time that you went through so that you can get restored onto where God wants you to be. Amen. That was from a young man. Amen. Good. Now, folks, I want you to understand, I agree in part with, with what was said, uh, mostly. But I want us to understand that usually when people speak, everybody who speaks, not, is not, everyone who speaks is not going to say what you want to hear. We don't have the same mind. So when someone says something that you don't agree with, I don't want you to feel like you have to oppose. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. What we really want is what the Bible tells us and we'll get there, okay? So don't feel you have to feel bad or offended when somebody says something that you don't agree with. We all have different minds. We have been through different situations and they shape how we sometimes think, okay? How we sometimes think, okay? Sorry about that. Now, according to psychologists, they generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or group. I want you to understand what it says. It is a conscious, deliberate decision. Hello? A conscious, deliberate decision. Our problem is, as I observed from the very beginning of this, this discussion, is that we tend to put forgiveness or attach forgiveness with our emotions. 
That's why everybody hand went up when I said, let me see those who would forgive him. Everybody hand went up. But when I rephrased the same question and asked how many of us would really forgive the person, not even one-eighth of the hands went up. And that is because of the emotions that are usually attached to whether we forgive or not. We must first understand that forgiveness is a command given to us from who? God. God gave us a command to do what? To forgive. And anything God commands, we must do. Hello? Therefore, I can understand if you are hurt and you have your little feelings, you feel rough. You may not want to forgive. But how you feel does not determine whether you do what God says to do or not. Are we together? Even the best of things that we can think of doing. If God says don't do it, we should still not do it. So whatever God says to us to do, regardless if we think we don't want to do it or it is wrong or whatever our emotions may be, the fact of the matter remains we must forgive. Coming out of the scenario, she said that he cheated how many times? Many times. Here's what I know about good church folks. Good church folks can forgive you one time. Good church folks may forgive you two times. But good church folks may have a problem forgiving you three times. Especially for the same thing. Am I in church? So I want to ask you the question this, uh, this morning. How many time, times do you think you should forgive your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, or your spouse, your wife, whoever, for cheating on you? Somebody tell me. I want somebody to tell me that. No, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Brethren. 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 I want you to hold on. I know the discussion is sweet. I know it has some of your minds running. But we are coming from a biblical context and perspective. Now watch this. Jesus made a very profound statement, which he did not qualify. Now me asking you that question is not a justification for any man or woman in here to feel that it is a right for him to go and fornicate or commit adultery because he will be forgiven. It is not a right. Hello? That is not what I'm advocating. But however, I understand from the Bible's perspective that God has said some things that are very clear. Now, the problem with us, like with Justin, we want, to, we want to put how many times? And we like Peter. So I, before I get myself into any trouble, I want to bring a passage of scripture to the forefront. And then you will tell me and you will crucify me after. Is that okay? All right. So let's go. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Watch this. You all think the Bible is easy? Then came Peter to him and said what? Lord, how oft shall I, shall what? Shall my brother what? Sin against me. Sin against me. And I forgive him till seven times. <laughs> Peter asked God, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against, sins against me? Is it seven times? All right. Now when, when you ask Jesus a question, you should get a what? An answer. And we believe that Jesus is a very serious man, right? And when he says something, he's very fear. Isn't that so? Good, let's go on. Jesus saith unto him, what? I say not unto thee until seven times, but what? But what? Anybody can do the calculation? 400 and how many times? 400 and how many times? 90 times. And that is for the what? A different offense or the same offense? Huh? In the day. Good. Now the pastor is, is qualifying and clarifying. The pastor is saying to me that Jesus, what Jesus said to Peter was 470, 490 times sorry for the same sin in one day. So that's the number of times Jesus said you should forgive in a particular day for a specific offense, the same offense. Are we together? Hello? So now this is Bible. When you read, when you understand the context and the time in which he was speaking to Peter, you will get that. You get that from, from understanding the biblical context, which you don't get in the passage, but you get through studying. Yes? 
No, let me, under, let me explain to you now. Now we have understand. Okay, so let's forget. Let's forget the whole in the same day story because some of you are looking for an excuse. But 490 times, what do you want to say is in your lifetime for the same sin? Talk to me now. How many times must you forgive your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend for cheating on you? Somebody talk to me. I ask you, forgive, you know, forgive. Remember what the, what the definition for forgiveness is. Forgiveness is to let go all resentment and all the thing about vengeance and bad blood. Some of you all think I'm saying that if a young boy cheated on you 490 times that you should still go ahead and marry him. I'm not saying that. I'm speaking to you about forgiveness. So ladies, let go of the emotions. I ain't telling you to go and get yourself used up and abused up. Hello? According to the Bible, how many times should you forgive for the same sin? 400 and? Hold on. Somebody said all the time. Hold on. But hold on. I get into that point. Does the Bible tell us as well that we should forgive others as God forgives us? Hello? Hold on. So let me ask you, how many times have God forgiven you for the same offense? And how many times will God forgive you for the same offense? Now, if we are told in Scripture that we should forgive as God has forgiven us, how many times do you think we should forgive each other? From the dust of the ground, God formed man and breathed into him the breath of life. When the Israelites were trapped with their backs to the sea, Moses stretched out his staff and the waters were parted. Samson struck down a thousand oppressors of Israel with the jawbone of a donkey. At the blast of trumpets and a war cry, Joshua watched the walls of Jericho crumble. With torches and empty jars, Gideon and 300 men defeated an army of 100,000. David chose five smooth stones from the stream and with them, he struck down Goliath. 5,000 were fed with only five loaves and two fish. If God can use such small things to change the course of history, certainly he can use you. So with a sincere heart and you're genuinely sorry, you will be forgiven, right? Oh, so, so wait a minute. This if this guy isn't sincere and he's with her, 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 her. He's with that person. He, that one, that one. I forgive you today. Tomorrow he with that one, that one, that one. I forgive you tomorrow. That one, that one, that one. I forgive you to the, the next day. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And at what point? As you as a Christian, you're forgiving. What we, happens to your, your spirit in all of that? All right, brethren, I see a problem here. Some of you are misunderstanding what forgiveness is, and some of you are trying to run ahead of the discussion. Stay with the discussion. I am not a madman. I'm not going to come here and tell any female or any male that he should be in a relationship where the young lady or the young man is running all over the place with all sorts of body and doing all sorts of things. And every time you come, okay, I forgive you and you still go back. That is not wise and we'll get to that place. But right now we are dealing with how many, because we can deal with forgiveness like this now because forgiveness is not a matter of how you feel. It is a command God has given to you. So regardless of whether the person tell you they're sorry or not, you have to forgive. And more so, forgiveness is not just about the person. 
it is about you as well. Because how can God forgive you when you have not forgiven somebody else? That's what the Bible says. Are we together? So don't mix up or get confused about... Okay. Okay. All right. We want all the... <laughs> Gentlemen, we want the males to please stand. <laughs> the males, we want about 15 males to please stand. You are in here and the Holy Spirit tells you stand. They give up their seat. Gentlemen, I want you to know those of you who are standing, you're going to be asked to give up your seats. So that the ladies can sit. You're already standing. So ladies who are on the outside, the Holy Spirit ha would have just moved some men for you. So you, can, you have room in here to sit. We have some seats at the front as well. Okay, let's settle back. Let's go quickly. Pastor Peter, is you on the point? Huh? Okay, Pastor Peter said he cannot remember. But what I'm saying to you, brethren, is this. Remember, let's go quickly. Yeah, there is a difference. There is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, and that is where um, she wanted to go. But that's not where you are yet. Not yet. And forgiveness is not dependent on the person asking to be forgiven. That's where we are. That's where we are now. Yes. You don't have, according to God's plan, according to God's plan, if you have wronged me, I am to forgive you whether or not you have asked for forgiveness and whether or not your behavior has changed. Correct. That has nothing to do with Nothing God. to do with it. It's because it's a command. It's just like people, like we always speak about people who worship on Sunday. They have the reasons. They have their traditions. They have their heritage. They have all the reasons in the world. But that still does not make it any right for them because God has made a clear command in, in uh, the fourth commandment. He says what? Remember what? So whatever God has commanded, how we feel, what we think, what our parents say, does not determine whether we do it or not. Once God says it, we do it. You may not always feel like doing it, but you have to do it because what? God said to do it. More so when we understand the spiritual connection as it relates to you and God and forgiving others, you will forgive. Because the Bible tells us that God cannot hear our prayer when we have hatred or vengeance. You know what it is to have unforgiveness in your heart for someone? vengeance, resentment, how can you pray to God with all of that in your heart? And so that's why we are saying, even if the person has not said sorry, even if the person don't come and say, well, for, but for your own spirituality, you must forgive. Because you cannot be talking to God and expect God to hear you with that kind of evil and sin in your heart. Let's go. So you just, had, you just said the same, thing, the same thing I was going to say. Oh? Because I was going to say the story where they said, if your brother wrongs you, and you go to a man to God. Good. Leave God the God offering God. and go back. Yes, and go back. You're a big man. Are you reading Bible and thing? Yes, yes. Yes, I. Sebastian, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I was also going to read that text, but I have another text to read. Um, when we talk about forgiving others, we need to remember that we're all sinful. And the Bible says in Luke 6, 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So we as sinners, we sin every single day. And if we choose not to forgive, we in turn will not be forgiven. But watch this. Even in the very passage of scripture that we read, Matthew 18, 21 to 22, don't we see the same offense being committed time and time again? And Peter said what? Seven times. And Jesus said what? No, Peter, not seven times. But what? 490 times. So you ask the question, should I forgive the person if the person continually hurts me? Hello? And let's forget about the boyfriend-girlfriend thing. What about when the person continually says things and does things outside of boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that hurts you? The church member, do you continue to forgive? Hello? Yes. You have to. Moving on. Quick question again. If I forgive a person, do I stay in an abusive situation? Do I stay in an abusive situation? Miss Wave, could you, could you tell me a few abusive situations that you could think about? I know that there is sexual abuse. Anything else you know? Verbal abuse, what else you know? Emotional abuse, what else you know? Physical abuse. Spiritual abuse. 
All right, spiritual abuse. <laughs> but here's what I know. Most times when women speak about abuse in relationship, and we talk about boyfriend, girlfriend, they usually look at sexual um, relations, whether the young man is faithful or he cheating or not. But what about the verbal abuse? What about physical abuse? Because you know, ladies, sometimes you're not easy with your mouth. And some people think that men are made out of steel. Hello? And you say all what you want to say. Even if you don't mean it, you still say it. That is called what? Verbal abuse. So we are saying, as much as I have to forgive you for all the different forms of abuse, do I forgive you and still stay in that situation because I have forgiven you? No. I want somebody to tell me why. Somebody tell me why. Yes, sister, to the mic. As far as I know, God is the God of order and saints. And it's not common sense that God gave me to stay in that relationship. And God wants the best for you. And if you stay in that relationship, it definitely will not be the best at all. And the Lord said that he, has, he wants you to prosper, be in good health and everything. And that, as far as I know, is the complete opposite of that. So that would be doing what God has not asked you to do, correct? Good. All right. I agree. Somewhat. But here is what I think. Because of time, I'll tell you what I think. You have to love people as you love yourself. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Staying in an abusive relationship with an abuser tells me that you don't love yourself, one, and you also don't love the person. If you love the person, you will try your best to ensure that that person does not commit that act again, or that person gets help. When you stay in the abusive relationship, what you do is you allow yourself to be abused and you allow the person to become even a further, a greater abuser. Are you with me? So I'm not telling you that you discard the person and treat the person like nothing, but you love the person and your concern would be your safety, but also the well-being and development of the person. Because you loving the person, you're not going to be satisfied with the person remaining or be staying as an abuser. You would want to see that person change, isn't that so? Yes, because you love the person. You are not just coming out of the abusive relationship because you've been abused. That tells me that you did not love the person. Are we together? As much as you would have felt that the person didn't love you because the person abused you, the same can be said. If you are getting out of an abusive relationship, which you should, even if it is separation, so you give the person time to work out the issues with a counselor and get the proper um, attention and counseling they need. Hello? But you don't just say, well, I done with you and that is it, and you forget about the person and you hate the person because then you have other issues again of forgiveness. Once you're doing it the right way, you will, yes, you'll look out for your well-being, but you'll also look out for the well-being of the person. Are we together? Yeah. So don't feel, well, you abuse me and I got to get on bad and I got to do what? No. You get out because you are thinking about your safety as well, but because you are Christian and because you love, you're also concerned about the person who has abused you. So as much as you are getting out, you will, and you will tell the person, well, I am getting out, and I, I am leaving, not because I don't love you, but because I am concerned about my well-being, and I'm also concern, concerned about your well-being. So as someone who loves you, I will tell you this, get proper help for yourself. Speak to someone. See if you can get your attitude and behaviors changed. See if there is something deep-seated in you that triggers you or causes you to behave that way. Because I know, apart from the abuse, you are a good person. And start to tell the person good things about themselves. But the abuse, I will not tolerate because it is not good for me, neither is it good for you. It is not good for your spirituality, and it is not good for my spirituality. Because remember, the man who is abusing you, he is sinning. Are we together? He is what? He is sinning. We agree on that? Or the pastor talk heresy? So everybody quiet like that, you, you, you think I have to really do that for that person? Yes, because you love. And that is how God deals with us. And God says to do what? Forgive and treat others like he treats us. Isn't that so? God died for us while we were yet as what? While we were yet what? His enemies. In high school, we had a recital one year. Teenage musicians, they were already pretty good at what they did. There was one musician, though, that struggled from the beginning. His fingers stumbled and they were all on top of each other. You could see his frustration building until one point he just lifted both of his hands and dropped and pounded on the keyboard. It's like we heard every note all at the same time. The music teacher joined the student on the stage. He said to him, you know, sometimes we just need a do-over. We need to start fresh. 
One way of thinking about baptism is a fresh start. Baptism acknowledges where I am, but it announces where I'm going. It's a priority to live life with God, no matter where I've been, what I've done, what I've thought about doing. Baptism isn't to make us perfect, it's to announce a priority to live first with God. Even though that recital was long ago, I'll always remember because the teacher walked off the stage with the student and entered again and sat down beside him. The teacher said to the student, now start over and I'll stay right here with you. And what we heard was simply beautiful. Question is what if I forget and not forget? Forgive and not forget. What if I forgive and not forget? Is that possible? Yes. All the women over here will say yes. I rest on your face where he says you have the right to remain silent because anything you say can and will be used against you in further conversations. Do you think when you forgive you should forget? What what does it mean when we say forgive and forget? Anybody, one person. When we say forgive and forget, what do we mean? Okay. Correct. It did five times. When we say forgive and forget, what we are saying is when you have forgiven someone for stealing your shoes, every time you see the person or the person does you something wrong, you don't tell the person, remember, you stole my shoes. Hello? Every time you see the person with your shoes, you know it is your shoes. The factory only made one like it. It is your shoes. And you see the person with your shoes. Every time you see the person, you don't get upset and try to tell the person, I know it's you that steal my shoes. Because you have already done what? You have forgiven. How do I know that? Remember, the Bible tells us to do what? Forgive as God has forgiven you. When God forgives us, does, God, does he come back and say, well, remember you do that last month? Wait, but five minutes ago you just do that and you come back again? Hello? Is that how God forgives us? So what does that tell us about forgiving and forgetting? Forgetting doesn't mean that your memory is white. Because trust me, God doesn't, God doesn't forget a thing. God's memory better than yours and mine. But God does not what? Hold it against us. He does not what? Hold it against us. Because if you and I can remember things from 19, 19, how much, how much? You don't think God can remember things from the beginning? Hello? Yes, so don't think that is that God memory failing him, but is that God does not hold it against us. To him, it, it didn't even happen. He said he would cast it into what? The sea of what? Forgetfulness. You, Pastor Peters? I forgive you. Thank you. Go, it, it, let me see if I could explain the forgetting thing from God's perspective. God Sanctuary only, style. Huh? Sanctuary style. Yeah, yeah. God only forgives us once for something. God can only forgive us once for something. If we commit the same act again, God is forgiving us for it for the first time, the second time. Because the first time, Cease to exist. He, he, it ceases to exist. So when, when you commit the same act the third time, if you commit the same act of adultery the third time, we're not talking about your spouse, we're talking about God. You've committed adultery for the third time. You should not pray and ask God to forgive you again. Because that would mean he did not forgive you the first time. You're asking God to forgive you. And as far as God is concerned, you have committed adultery for the first time. All right, well put. But I put you all in real trouble. That put you all in real trouble. Because now that Pastor Peter has clarified how God forgives, and we are supposed to forgive how God forgives. Lord, have mercy.
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When well, your mother tell me don't hit you, sorry. Pastor Granville, I'm sorry. But this is what we are saying. And that is why, <laughs> that is why forgiveness is such a, a difficult thing for, for some of us as Christians. Because we cannot comprehend why I must continually forgive somebody who does the same thing to me over and over again. But here is what I will tell us, brethren. When, these things, when we are faced with situations like that, we should not be discouraged as Christians. Yes, the pain and the, and the hurt and all of that is real. But we must always see the bigger picture. Being a Christian is being Christ-like. And how else can we become Christ-like unless these things are developed in us? Forgiving someone repeatedly for the same thing, it does not mean that you're stupid or you're weak. It is only an indication to you as to where you are spiritually, as to where you are grow whether you are growing or whether you are really true to that name that you behold, which is called Christian. Are you with me? I know we're not having church up in here, sister. You, 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 you're looking for me to preach a sermon, but you better keep quiet in the left over here. But this is what it says to us as Christians. It is easy to talk the faith. It is easy to talk the forgiveness. It is easy to talk these things. But here is when the rubber meets the road. These things are not just about hurting us. But it is for us to understand whether we are growing in Christ. Whether we are becoming Christ-like. Or whether we are Christ-like or not. How can, you, or how can I be Christ-like when I fail to forgive you, Sister Paula? Are we understanding the concept that we're dealing with today? Forgiveness is more than you just saying, I forgive somebody or somebody wronged you. It is about an opportunity for you to grow in Christ and for you to develop your spirituality and for you to really know too where you are with Christ. We must always look at the bigger picture and evaluate things. We are Christians and in everything we are supposed to reflect Christ and God's love. Are we together, brethren? Husband and wives, reflect God's love by the way you relate and treat, we treat each other. That is why God often relates his church as his bride. Isn't that so? Yes, and he is the husband. And that relationship tells you how husband and wife should relate to each other. Ella, last, last question and let's move on because we have to end this up here. Yes, Pastor. Uh, really, what we are saying here, I understand Pastor Peters. And if you remember, the Bible tells persons that those who are spiritual go and deal with a brother. Sometimes persons deal with persons so harsh. And in church, if somebody does something wrong, that person now is seen like a criminal sometimes. Persons are in a clique and still talking of issues that should have been forgiven understanding that you yourself doing all kinds of stuff that persons are not seeing and then you are holding a brother you are holding a brother um guilty of a crime that he asked forgiveness for came to the church for forgiveness for and you are not allowing that brother to be thing so sometimes it's critical who we let who we let deal with those persons to make the reconciliation after they ask for forgiveness I thank you very much, Ella Cox. Okay, we're going to have Simon, Pastor Peters, then me, and then we're going to close. Let's go, please. Can we use our model for forgiveness? Um, can we take that from God's dealing with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Because they sinned against God. God put them out the garden. But did he keep bringing back to them that you are sinners and that I will not, and, and you have done this wrong and, and, and you're the worst people in the world? Did he do that to them? Can we use that as a as our template for forgiveness? Yes, we can. And if we you and that's a perfect template for that's a perfect template for the abusive situation. When we said that if you would stay with someone in an abusive situation, and I said no because of your love for the person. Remember the reason why God put Adam and Eve out of the garden was also for their benefit. Because you, you imagine if they had eaten that fruit of life, you know what would happen? So we must understand when God, every action God takes towards us is always out of love, even in correction. Are we together? I know when my grandmother used to give me lashes, it wasn't because she hated me, it was for my good. 
And we must always understand, even when we do things and we are forgiven, there are still consequences that we have to deal with, okay? Let us be clear on that. I think that is straightforward. Because let's say a young lady goes and she has sex. She's really sorry that she had sex, but she had unprotected sex. As much as she's sorry if that young man had HIV, she have HIV. All the sorry she's sorry in the world, not going to change that. Are we together? As much as, as he's sorry, he's sorry, she gets pregnant, all the sorry he's in the world, all the forgiveness he receives in the world is not going to change the fact that he ejaculated in her and she is now pregnant. Are we together? As much as we are forgiven, it does not take away the natural consequences of our actions. Hello? Good. Final question. Final question is this. What would happen if I don't forgive? And then Pastor Peters. Matthew 6, 14. What happens if I don't forgive? Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, what? Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And the opposite is true. If you forgive men not their trespasses, how then can your heavenly Father forgive you? When we understand forgiveness, it is more than just you and the person. It also involves God. More so, when it is between two Christians, hello, more so when it is between two Christians, two church people who say they know God, who say they're reading the Bible. Because I know in some churches you have people who vex with people for 20 and so years and cannot remember the details of why we vex. You just know we vex. Just know I, I, I know I have a problem with you. I cannot tell you what it is, but I just know I have a problem with you. But I want to ask you the question. Imagine you have had forgiveness in your heart, unforgiveness in your heart for someone for 20 years, and you're going to church, and you're praying for 20 years. I want you to think about that, and it is that real, and it is that serious. The Bible says, those of us who regard iniquity in our hearts, God will not hear our words. Or pray. When we sit and we meditate and we say, I'm not forgiving her, I'm not forgiving him. You regarding iniquity in your heart. That is something you actually sit and decide I am going to do. And for 20 years, you have not forgiven. But for 20 years, you are a good Seventh-day Adventist. Coming to church and praying. And even voting your hand to disfellowship people. As if you got good fellowship. God expects us, as difficult as it may be, the hurt, the emotion, to respond in love and Christ-likeness to our brethren and others. Because we are Christians. We are Christ-like. More so, we are trying to become more and more like Christ every day. And when we have these opportunities to show or become more like him, we should do the right thing and follow his command, which is to forgive. Yeah. I want to thank you very much today for your participation, your interaction. I was truly blessed. How about you? Yeah. I know some of us have some forgiving to go and do. Go and do it. I know you feel happy and excited. Now is a good time to go and forgive somebody. Just for, Once you're feeling hot, forgive. Because if you go home and you, you think about it, you may not do it. Now you're feeling hot and excited, run and tell the person I forgive you and done with it. Because that's what God expects of us today. The God Stop is a source of encouragement to me. It gives me hope to know that there are other young persons like Mesa who are on fire for Jesus and are willing to share His word to everyone. It reminds me that it's not only by sharing out a priority magazine or giving out a track to someone we meet or even having a crusade, but this is also another medium through which we can use to spread the word of Jesus to everyone. To me, the God's Up is a place of encouragement, it's a place of inspiration, it's a place of motivation. For me personally, when I see what happens on the God's Up every Friday night, I'm encouraged to know that God's Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is filled with young people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and whose desire is to see that the gospel message of Jesus Christ reaches the world, reaches young people, wherever they are, in a very professional way in this form. I thank God for the God Stop every day. I thank God for the young people on the God Stop every day who have dedicated their time and their energy and their talent to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. May God continue to bless them in a mighty way.
for one, they gotta stop me is hope. You know, in a world where there's so much pressure on the youth, everybody is just pressuring the youth to do this. There's temptation. There's all sorts of things coming at you and aimed at the youth. The gotta stop me is hope, and it's also a support system to see a bunch of youth working for God and doing all they can for God. It's a great encouragement when you see young people like that working for life. And also being a part of the God system, God stop, <laughs> being a part of the God stop is a pleasant reminder that God can use anyone. You know, you hear the song, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. But when God actually uses you, it's a great feeling. If I had to sum it all up in three words, I'd say relatable, genuine, and innovative. Because when young people watch The God Stop, or even non-Christians, they usually say that concept you discussed or that example that was given, that is so me. And because of your discussion, this Christianity thing or this, this Jesus person, it doesn't seem that difficult or that far beyond me. And this is something I can do. And for me, that is true ministry. And plus, the God Stop is something that has never been done in Barbados before, so I'm very happy to be a part of it. And that's what the God Stop means to me. What impressed me with the God Stop? The first time I went on the road show to Bethel Life Church, and I saw the diligence and the spirituality that the, both the young men and the young women had. And it gave me a love and a feeling. And I say to the Lord, I hope that this program would continue to help other young people to be, to be um, able to serve God as our young people is serving because there are lights of light in this dark world. There are lights in this dark world of sin. I don't want to repeat what she has said, but I really want to the things that I impressed is the diligent work that the guys put in the work that they were doing and the activity was very um, meticulous in their work and even after they had finished you know they went about their duties with this decorum that I I, I said well I told my wife because we all was together <laughs> that these guys you know are very seem to be very nice young spiritual men and I hope that this um, God's talk will be able to continue so that many souls will be born to call it blessing. Join us on the God Stop every Friday night at 7.15 p.m. at www.eastcarib.org where we stop and wait for God to take us wherever he wants us to go.